For many who were raised in the American West, the history of mid-19th century Overland Trail immigrants and pioneers may have loomed large in their childhood educational curriculums, in family lore, or in the historic sites or heritage tours around the regions they live in. Raised as a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormon pioneer history did loom large for me. But as a scholar, I think that the seemingly commonplace nature of Overland history deterred me from ever wanting to research it in a serious analytical way, as if there was nothing important to really think about there. Well, I was dreadfully wrong. Welcome to Writing Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Rensing. And this month we talk with historian Sarah Kyes about her new book, American Burial Ground, A New History of the Overland Trail, published just last month by the University of Pennsylvania Press. As she convincingly demonstrates, we all need to re-engage with Overland histories and their public memory. It mattered then, and it matters now. Thanks for listening. For new listeners, allow me to take a moment to explain a bit about writing Westward and myself. Each episode features a conversation with people writing about the North American West. Historians, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, sociologists, and others. By showcasing their work, I hope to spark your curiosity to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the peoples who call it home. If a writer or topic intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brendan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation with me playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and everything else, all tasks for which I have no training. But I am passionate about the North American West, so this difficult work is well worth the excuse to read more books and talk to interesting people. At the end of each episode, I'll include a little bit more information about me and my scholarship and about the Red Center, our public programming and projects, and funding opportunities that you could apply for. With that, let me introduce a little bit more about today's guest and why we're talking to them. Sarah Kyes is an assistant professor of history at the University of Nevada, Reno. She earned her PhD from the University of Southern California and studies the intercultural relations between indigenous and Euro-American peoples, the environment, and other topics. After securing publications of articles in field-defining outlets like the Journal of American History and the Western Historical Quarterly, she's just published in October of 2023 her first book, which we discussed today, American Burial Ground. A New History of the Overland Trail. This re-examination of the Overland Trail reveals how the Overland immigrants who died along the way may not have been successful in reaching their far western destinations, but they were not failures in the broader expansionist American settler colonial project. As she writes, quote, dead immigrants eventually became an answer to another problem immigrants hadn't fully grappled with at the start of their journey how to definitively claim the West for the United States, end quote. As Kai's focuses on American graves along the Overland Route, their cultural meaning at the time and since, the interconnected histories of native dispossession and native burials, she convincingly recasts them in a central role to American cultural and physical expansion across the West. In essence, American graves on the Overland Trail these burials in native land, served as a sort of national flag planting, both claiming and sacralizing the land for the nation. Westerners should grapple with this and use it to think critically about past and present discussions of belonging in the region. Sarah Kyes, welcome to Writing Westward. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'd like to start by asking about the path that led authors to their topics. And I have a little bit of a weird one for you. Okay. Um, were you aware that there was a woman named Sarah Kyes who died on the Oregon Trail in 1846? Uh, yes, but that's not why I started researching the book. <laughs> but I am aware of it. And you might have noticed that she appears very briefly in the book. Um, and I made sure to do that 
because that is one of the first questions people always ask me. And I think it's a perfectly legitimate question. I completely skipped over that. I'm so embarrassed. Um, no, not at all. Well, if because I was thinking if you were not aware, maybe like her ghost, you know, was leading you to this. But apparently that's not the case. So t- tell us, how did you get to wanting to write about not just the Overland Trail, but about death and burial and not just tracing the horrors of the trail, but trying to figure out like, what does it mean? Right. Yeah. Well, that's such a good question. So um, actually, some of the first people I met who asked me if I knew about the other Sarah Kais who died on the trail were folks who came to visit a museum in Casper, Wyoming. Have you have you been to Casper? Yeah. Okay. It's kind of in the center of the state. And it was a big uh, stopping point on the trail. It was a uh, crossing of the Platte River. Uh, for some time. And then later it became a Civil War era fort. And I worked at that museum for a summer and I led tours there and I learned a lot about um, the Overland Trail while I was there. And I also got this question about Sarah Kyes. And it was really during my time there at that fort and at that trail crossing that I realized how monumental the story of this migration is and how many people still feel connected to it. And I was really interested to do something different with it. Yeah, and it it's not just people's individual connections with it, maybe because of their family history or their kind of regional heritage, but it looms large in national narratives, kind of as a second or third, I don't know what chapter in our national kind of founding mythologies, mm-hmm. right? One mm-hmm. of these big key moments. Exactly. The the scope of it is is quite huge. And given that scope, um, the scholarship on it is not as robust as it could be. Um, And so I saw a a chance to try to contribute to what others had already done. And as you said, um, think anew about the meanings of the trail experience. I think this is especially important for topics like this, where they have um, enjoyed real robust public interest and lots of kind of public history buff, non-academic writing about it. Uh, which I think sometimes deters academics from thinking critically, but like, oh, Overland Trail, that's just like a bunch of reenactors and history buffs that care about that. And it's a topic that's, it's not sexy, it's not exciting. So they actively avoid it. Mm-hmm. And as a result, th- there's not like good, as much good critical scholarship on it as we probably need. Yeah. No, I, I do think you're right about that. And I have to say that throughout my time researching this topic, and and it's been quite a while, throughout my time, I I encountered quite a few people, a few scholars who expressed that very opinion to me. And so it was always one of the things that motivated me to do this work was kind of that chance to to prove people wrong um, and show that this migration is not only something that's maybe revered in somewhat of a nostalgic way, but something that can really help push us forward in our understanding of the development of the United States West and, as you said, the nation at large. Well, I'm glad you're proving them wrong. You'll show them. <laughs> um, well, help us we'll wrap see. our head. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I think you have. Um, I want you to help us wrap our head around a few kind of big picture things before we really get into the weeds. Uh, I think most people understand that people in the mid-19th century, the American West or elsewhere, They dealt with death on a much more regular basis than we do today. It loomed larger in daily life. But I still think that a lot of us underestimate that. Can can you give us just a real quick primer on kind of the the ubiquity of death in daily life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. Um, And I really do think that, you know, just to go back to your earlier question about how I got interested in death, is that really as a historian and as a person, I'm really interested in the lived human experience. And as you're saying, Brendan, the lived human experience was one that encompassed death in the mid 19th century, because it was so ubiquitous. And because it was something that people thought about and wrote about and talked about pretty much on a daily basis. So I was really interested in the cultural work that death did for people to understand their lives and also the ways in which death connected to much larger processes, such as colonialism and the expansion of the United States. Um, But if we're going to think about the experience of death, I think one of the things that we have to understand is that it was something that could basically come at 
any time, you know, and even in the 21st century, a lot of people have access to medical care and antibiotics and all of these things that make us sort of, when we think about our lives, we can often imagine a long trajectory into the future. And that's not, that's just not how people lived on a daily basis. You know, um, when parents had babies, you know, they, they don't know what's going to happen to that child. They'll do their best, but there was so much that was out of their control. And I think even the story I start with at the beginning of the book about a nine-year-old girl who loses her father on the trail, you know, her story was not unique. Um, what made it unique was the fact that they were on their way to Oregon when he died. Yeah. I think it's hard for us to wrap our heads, at least in the United States. There's mm -hmm. places in the world where, yeah. unfortunately, people are still kind of living in that paradigm. Uh, my my son's in junior high and he's in a history class and he had to read a history book this last week and he got like it was about the civil war and and death and stuff and he was like getting really excited about it which had me like oh my goodness maybe he's actually going to get into history right but one thing he was like yeah people were just dying of like they'd get a little cut and then they would get infected and they would die and it kind of blew his mind that just Today, we think like old age, cancer, heart attacks, a car crash is some of those things. I guess so some of those things are unexpected, but anyways, much we live much more predictable lives. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's great. Another context that I want to try to understand is the history of burial practices and what was going on kind of in this era of the 1820s, 30s, 40s. And you took a very unexpected kind of used a very unexpected entry point into this mm -hmm. um, by talking about Native American removal and Native resistance to removal kind of um, as a as an entry point or a counterpoint to how overlanders were thinking about death and burial. So um, how does this history of, you know, you know, say the Cherokee or the Trail of Tears and how they were leveraging or strategically rhetorically using burial as a way to resist removal how does that give us context for the overland burial practices right yeah that's that's such a good question and it it took me quite some time to see that connection and understand that context um but once it became clear it became very clear to me that in order to understand the ways in which the practices of burial and the understanding of what burial means in land um, in the nineteenth oh, in the nineteenth century United States, in order to understand that, we need we didn't need to focus on the Northeast and Protestant whites. We needed to really understand conversations that were happening across cultural and racial lines in the United States, and that. In fact, removal becomes an impetus for these conversations. So I'm going to take you back to the 1820s. What we have in the United States among white Protestants is sort of a growing conversation about how to bury the dead and where to bury them. And this is a moment at which um, white Protestants are embracing what becomes known as the rural cemetery movement, where they're focusing on more and more on the surrounding environment in which their dead are buried and they want to bury them in places that are beautiful and tranquil and places where they can go and visit and connect with their loved ones places that are open to the public it's almost like it's almost akin to uh, a a very sort of not Disneyland in the entertainment way, but Disneyland in the place that this is a lovely place you would go with your family and you would also connect with your dead loved ones. It's a, it's a, it's a clean space. It's a safe space. It's a harm. It's a harmonious space. And so it becomes really, really important to know where those dead are so that you can continue to have that connection with them pending what Protestants see as a heavenly familial reunification when the living will reunite with their dead after they've died as well. Um, and so that conversation is very much about familial ties, but it's also very much tied up with nationalism because the conversation around the rural cemetery movement is also about the white dead sort of replacing the native dead in the soil and the ways in which these burial grounds or these cemeteries, which is the important term that comes out of this movement, the ways in which these cemeteries are 
um, overlaying previous practices in which the white dead being put into the landscape make that land more American. But there's a concurrent conversation and movement coming out of indigenous nations in the Southeast who are opposing removal, who are saying the exact opposite, who are saying that we have cared for our dead, our dead are here, this is where we want to stay, is with them, that we share your connection to wanting to be close to your dead. We share your understanding that bodies in the ground constitute a claim on the landscape. So it's very recognizable to white Protestants, but it's used in opposition to colonial expansion. And the connection becomes clear not only because of the shared terminology, but also because the ways in which President Andrew Jackson, who's a big proponent of removal, and members of his administration directly respond to this language that Native peoples like the Cherokee and Choctaw are using to refute removal. And Jackson and others try to respond to it by saying, no, removal is still okay. And so I saw that what I was seeing in the 1840s is actually something that started earlier. And it's something that didn't just come from white Protestants. It came from the United States as this expansionist nation that was trying to push Native people out and the way in which Native peoples were shaping that conversation. And how does the vanishing Indian narrative, somewhat concurrent with this, how does that play out in these conversations? That's such a good question. So one of the components of um, the removal uh, campaign is to say, well, Native peoples are you know, vanishing anyway from the United States. If we push them west, maybe we'll save them. But ultimately, they don't see a path forward for Native people because of this racist casting of them as people destined to disappear. Um, and so they say they will simply vanish away and they make it sound very natural, like just the way in which, you know, rivers and creeks wa wash away the banks over time. So will Native peoples pass. Um, and that's the kind of trope in American literature of this time that is just so prominent. Like you have these figures in like the books that everybody is reading, you know, James Fenimore Cooper, they appear in textbooks of the time. You were mentioning your son reading about the Civil War. So white American children are reading this fallacious narrative um, in textbooks in school. And part of the language with which Native people resist removal and resist this perception that they'll vanish away is they say that's absolutely not true, you know, and other scholars have worked on this, you know, I always think of, of Jeff Osler's work in this context, um, that they're very, very aware that this is a narrative. And they're also very, very aware and very, very skilled at combating that. Yeah, so it's interesting, like simultaneously, we're going to see how uh, Americans buy into this idea that uh, having your ancestors buried in the land does give you some kind of claim, it, it sacralizes that land. And it yeah, uh, you now belong on it. But in so doing, they realize that they consciously or subconsciously, that the natives have a better competing claim. And so the vanishing Indian narrative kind of disarms that claim, right? Mm -hmm. So they're simultaneously able to use the native argument for themselves while saying, yeah, but that's no longer doesn't no longer applies to you. Yes. And you put that really well. And that's an element in the rural cemetery movement, where it's not only that we're going to build these cemeteries, but we're going to kind of take over these native graves for ourselves, right? Mm. Because their people are vanishing, you know, and, and you know, Gene O'Brien's work on firsting and lasting is really important here. These native peoples are vanishing, but we can still memorialize their tombs as people of the past and will become the new people who come in and sort of um, appropriate those cemeteries and those markers and those bodies in the ground for ourselves. This is maybe somewhat tangential and off topic and something you haven't thought about, but I'm curious if you think that um, if, you know, there's a lot of tropes in like horror movies or um, kind of that genre of literature about, you know, Indian burial grounds and they're disturbed and then there's like, you know, a curse and like all this stuff happens. Do you think that's like a subconscious way in which American culture was trying to process kind of this latent guilt that they felt about it? Um, maybe. I, I mentioned Pet Cemetery very briefly <laughs> in the final chapter, which might be what you're referencing. Yeah. And I have to say, like, I personally am not like a horror movie fan. Um, 
But I did read a little (laughs) bit about this. And I think that part of what's happening in the late 20th century, and this is, again, I'm indebted to some other um, critics here, but I think, but I do agree with them. And I think that part of what's happening is in many ways, this is sort of a, in many ways, it's a continue, there's a strong thread of continuity here. That these themes of, you know, the dead left behind and this potential of, you know, retribution for past wrongs. Um, This was something that whites talked about in the 19th century, too. Um, And I don't know if it's so much guilt as it is in some ways this threat that, you know, these ghosts might come up and, and get you is just the I, the continuation of white victimhood and the continuation of even as you've claimed this land knowing that the way in which it was claimed was was really wrong and mm-hmm. that you might eventually pay for that okay well maybe we should get to the actual overland trail that was probably way <laughs> too long of an intro um Let's talk about if this is about death and better. How, how are people dying in, in popular imagining? You know, Western films and stuff. You know, it's it's the dangers are like native attacks or um, like big um, weather events or blizzards or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk a lot instead, though, uh, about cholera. Yes, um, it's just so gross. It really is. I mean, I mean all, all of these diseases were really <laughs> um, gross. They were horrible ways to go. Um, but how, so so why is cholera so important and rhetorically why is that then left out of our popular narratives why does instead focusing on these other things what does that do for americans mm that's interesting yeah um so someone someone asked me once recently like what's different between your book and like the oregon trail game right and I said, I said, less dysentery, more cholera. I mean, there's dysentery too, but cholera is really critically important because of the amount of people that it kills and also because of the way that cholera figures as really the most threatening disease of 19th century America, right? So people are dying all the time. We talked about this. You know, you get a cut, you get infected, you can die. There's all sorts of ways to go. But the way that really freaks people out to go is cholera. And part of the reason why is because it can kill so quickly. It is so sudden. So if you live in a world where death can come at any time, you might lose people at any time, you have also developed systems of rituals and traditions to deal with that. And part of that is the chance to say goodbye. And for the person who's dying to you know, accept what's happening to them, express their religious conviction that they're going to heaven and pass on words to their loved ones who surround them. If you get cholera, which is caused by a bacteria that can kill you in less than 24 hours, you're going to be immobilized and speechless towards the end, and you might not have that chance. And so the rapidity with which cholera kills and then the gruesomeness of its symptoms, where a lot of people, because they're dehydrated so quickly, they already look corpse-like before they've actually passed, really reveals that this attempt to make death death less horrific than it is through all these rituals and traditions and acceptance, it makes that really hard to bridge that gulf. And so cholera becomes really threatening around the globe in this time period. And then it plays out in unique ways on the trail. You you also write about some of the... this looms large in the journals and diaries uh of overlanders um and it these these moments of trying to care for uh the dying but you know it often goes so so quickly but you also note that like this really differs by group if it was a group of miners that were all men if it was family groups uh explain to us how that plays out a little bit differently yeah yeah so one of the things that distinguishes the 19th century experience with death from our own is how closely tied family members were to the entire process, right? The physical care of the body up until the very end, and then the care for the remains um, after life had expired. And the process of traveling on the trail makes this type of care more difficult to access. Because if you're at home, 
you're going to be cared for typically by your female loved ones. So it might be your wife, your mother, your sister, your daughter. All these people are going to gather around and do this really laborious work of taking care of these very sick people until they pass. And what happens is that on the trail, you often might not have those family members around you. So some people do, or they at least have some. But cholera sort of peaks along with migration to the California gold fields, which means that you have a skewed demographic of many companies that are all male miners. Um, and so these male miners, they plan ahead for this care. They say, we're going to stick together, sick or well, you know, we are responsible for taking care of each other. But they all know that it's not quite the same because if you're caring for someone and, for example, they didn't know how cholera worked. It's unlikely they'll be able to save the person's life. What they really want out of this care is that emotional support and comfort. And that's going to be very, very different if it's coming from, you know, your neighbor, John, who's the same age as you are, than from your mother who's cared for you since you were a little baby. Um, so that adds another layer to it. Um, and the kind of the extremities of the trail experience you explain really uh, I mean, so in many for many groups, caring for the dying is very different on the trail. But then interring them, like burying them, what do we do with the body? All of those practices that we're maybe developing, like you say, with this rural cemetery movement, uh, it, you have to, you have to keep on moving on the trail, or maybe yeah. you're sick yourself, or you're coming up against the end of the season and you know bad weather is coming. Whatever it is, um, or the ground is frozen and you can't yeah. bury. So. Overlanders are forced by necessity to abandon a lot of funerary and burial practices. Um, what are some of the new I mean, innovations? Isn't the word that that sounds very strange? <laughs> um, but what are some of the new things that they they are, are forced to do, and how do they how do they wrestle with that? Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that they begin to talk about a lot is what's going to happen to the bodies after they leave them, and how can they protect them. And this is something, you know, John Coleman has written about, and I, I see it a lot on the trail too, is uh, people are very, very concerned that somebody is going to get into the remains after they've moved on. Um, and they're worried that it could be Native people, which is not very likely, but it's something they worry about. And then they also principally worry about animals and specifically wolves. And so, and then when they're traveling, they see what they perceive as evidence of this desecration of the dead. They see bits of bone or tufts of hair or scraps of clothing. And all of this suggests these people who are completely concerned not only with where they put the remains, but that the remains remain complete. Um, and this is in part because of the belief in resurrection that the dead will re-arise um, as they were buried. Um, and so they are absolutely terrified of this. And so they're looking they, at this. They're, they're leaving their people behind. Yeah, and as they're moving on the trail, they're seeing what the the last group left behind, yes. and they're like, "Oh no, that's yes. that's going to be grandma exactly. in, in a few weeks." Exactly, exactly. So they're looking at this on the ground, and they're like, "What are we going to do?" And then one of the things they start having a conversation about is the practices of Native peoples, which on the plains is to raise the dead on scaffolds, sky burials. And, exactly. Exactly. And they say, oh, like maybe they do this so that the wolves won't get the dead. And they start to think about, well, what could we do differently now that we're on the plains? Um, and in some immigrant diaries, they they start to express um, an understanding of why scaffold burials might be a practice. And this is really important. And this is really important because and this is, I think, something we haven't we haven't talked about as much, but we did talk about sort of the mythological reach of the Overland Trail and the American national imaginary. And one of the things I just want to want to make clear is that that mythological reach of the Overland Trail existed before the 1840s. So this idea of traveling west, this idea of traveling overland, staking out new ground, making a home for yourself and your family in the west, that was something that existed. And the idea that this journey was, uh that this journey was something that made you an American, made you a Western, opened the door to opportunity, and was also this sort of daring adventure into what white Americans saw as wilderness or uncivilized land, that existed before these people started traveling. 
And they had really strong preconceptions of what the West was like and how they saw it as so sort of culturally backward. And for white Protestant Americans were burial underground, six feet underground to protect your dead um, was the standard for caring for remains. The idea of elevating your dead on a scaffold was completely the opposite right, of that. Six feet above ground. It's, exactly. You know. <laughs> so they had a lot of negative things to say about scaffold burials. But they get out on the planes and there's a significant amount of commentary in the journals and it also gets reprinted in published narratives of the trail and also fiction that gets written about the trail in the 19th century. They say, oh, I kind of understand this now. Um, and so they don't build scaffolds, but they do other things that are similar to native practices. And one of these things is to plant things like prickly pear on the tops of graves in the hopes of keeping animals from digging out the dead. Hmm. I mean, it's, it sounds like uh, maybe Frederick Jackson Turner, he didn't come up with his idea of the frontier, you know, transforming people out of whole cloth, you know, you no. suggest like it's very generic what you were saying was already kind of in the cultural you know zeitgeist um but you know turner also was saying you know this successive generational conquering of the frontier and rebuilding society is what transformed europeans into americans is what yeah. made them become something new do you think that um being f th this process of having to kind of reconsider burial practices and, and rethink how uh, you know, the relationship with the dead. Um, did Overlanders, do you think, did they come out of that on the other end, like transformed? Like, um, like do, 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 do you see it? Then, say that when they do settle in Oregon mm -hmm. or elsewhere, do they revert right back to their, those, those Protestant, you know, burial practices? Are they like, no, we got to get back to how we do it? So I think, I think that, the failure to um, to fulfill cultural ideas and conventions on the trail around burial, I think that failure transforms the American landscape and it transforms the landscape into something that white Americans see as uh, sacred and also in need of repair and fixing. And so I think that they themselves don't dramatically change white Americans don't dramatically change their burial standards and practices because of the trail, but they see the dead left along the trail as changing that landscape into something that needs care and protection. And this idea that the dead are nowhere and everywhere at the same time makes the makes the entire landscape of the West something that white Americans need to possess and intervene in and um, sort of sacralize in order to do right by the dead who immigrants couldn't do right by in the 1840s and 1850s. And so one of the things that Turner writes about in his thesis is this clean break between, you know, frontier and the end of the frontier, and we can't become Westerners anymore. And in fact, I think through trying to locate these dead, mark these dead. And this goes on into the 21st century. They're still doing this today with cadaver dogs. I think that that, that is a frontier experience that continues. Interesting. Um, and, and the idea that there is a failure on their part and it needs fixing also maybe contributes to this narrative of um, like if our ancestors suffered on this land and suffered like I guess unjust isn't the word, but like something went wrong, then we now belong here because we have to fix it. We have to do right by them. So it's another way to like lay, you know, kind of lay claim mm -hmm. um, to lands that weren't theirs. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's very active, right? Yeah. It's not a passive inheritance. It's an, it's an active inheritance. So even settlers who aren't connected through familial lines to these immigrants, but I think you're so right about the familial connections. So that's a really important part of this. But settlers who move in later to places like Nebraska, right? Like that is a very active inheritance for them, that they're not just on this land. They have to actively seek out, commemorate, memorialize, and mark these dead that were already there. And it gives them their that deeper history, and it gives them that opportunity to correct that failure and protect them. I think a lot of this happens, you know, through you know, K, well, they didn't call it K-12 education then, but, you know, you know, 
in those early formative years as kids are, you know, going through schools and stuff, there was a lot, you know, like say in Nebraska, right? There, there was a lot of talk about the pioneer heritage. And even if this kid, uh, his family had only showed up a few years before, like they're growing up being told, this is our regional heritage. This is your heritage. And they, we, we start to kind of buy into it, even if there's not a direct family connection, there's mm -hmm. a cultural, real cultural mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, another context you give to, um, you know, death and suffering of overlanders that uh, I think was really kind of revelatory is that these histories are directly intertwined with the concurrent violence of native removals and not just removals, but I mean, you actually capitalize it, the wars against native Americans, right. As yeah. Um, not technically like a single war, but like this whole set of, I mean, full on wars to eradicate yeah. native peoples. Um, so what happened? What happens to our reading of overland trail stories and histories when they're recontextualized, um, not just in the Civil War, but in these plains and farther west wars against Native peoples? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, talking about pioneer heritage, right? When we think about the common imagery of the overland trail, it's, you know, white top wagon, family, uh, maybe a father striding alongside with a gun, you know, a sun bonneted, sun bonneted pioneer mother, you know, some children. That's the image we have. And there were certainly those types of immigrants on the trail. But the trail itself, as a road, as a transportation hub, that was also, you know, used by the United States military. And in many ways, the justification of protecting those immigrant families becomes a way to expand violence across, against Native peoples. And as you said, this is a violence that extends across much of the 19th century. You know, I've, I've always found Elliot West's concept of greater reconstruction really compelling. Um, and the more I worked on this book, the more I just saw the intensity and the scope of this violence. Um, that was enacted by individuals, but, you know, also by by the state. And, you know, immigrants are so good about writing about their experience. I've read so many diaries of their suffering and their fear, and I know this was deeply felt. But I, in order to really tell this story as a proper history that centers us in the context of the 19th century, I had to make, try to make as vivid and as prominent that longer and deeper suffering of Native peoples who were being targeted by the United States as the United States expanded. So even if the overlanders themselves, um, you know, someone once used the, someone once used the analogy that often historical peoples, they like actors on a stage and they're, they're acting out this script. And um, even though they may not be fully aware of the full context and background of the script that's been handed to them. Right. And so, yeah, I think, I think the reactionary thing might be people saying, oh, why are you by focusing on all this other stuff? You're you're really dishonoring the, the true suffering and uh, the, the horrors that these overlanders who are just seeking a better life for themselves. And and that's not what's going on. Like, mm -hmm. like, I think many of them were fully, uh, you know, sincere. You know, they're going west to try to get a better life. Um whether they were consciously or subconsciously aware of the context of what was going on is sometimes maybe unclear, right? They were mm -hmm. participating uh, in a a violent uh, script. Yeah. Um, they were a part of it. Mm -hmm. And their being there brought violence. Uh, it, well, it preceded them. And then with the U.S. military, you know, violence is coming after them to protect the way and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, do you see in the journals... And I hadn't thought of this before, but do you see hints of like cognizance of this? Are they thinking critically about like, oh gosh, uh, our moving west has consequences for mm -hmm. Native peoples, brothers? Is there a lot of awareness of that? Mm -hmm. There is some awareness, yes, and they do think about it. You know, these are, you know, they're they're talking about a variety of of issues of the 19th century. They also talk about you know, slavery, right? So this is another commentary that they have, particularly as we're moving into the later 1850s. You know, um, for some pe for some people on the trail, this is their first experience of, of seeing enslaved African Americans. And they're also talking about their effects on Native peoples. So one of the things 
that centers around death and burials around that is that some immigrants think it's think for sport, for science, for whatever they're motivated by that they're the ones who are actually digging up the graves of the dead and and digging up native peoples or tearing down these um, scaffold burials. And other immigrants will say that's wrong. And, um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't desecrate the dead of those people. They, they know that these are things that are morally wrong and also things that are going to come back to hurt them because it is a violence visited against these people who occupy, who hold this land. Um, and there's other immigrants who are even more aggressive and assertive about how wrong or the negative consequences of their migration. Uh, one of these is John Beeson. So John Beeson travels the trail. He settles in Oregon and he speaks out against violence during his journey. And then also once he's in Oregon, which I'm sure is, as you know, has waves and waves and waves of violence against native peoples in this time period. And in fact, Beeson has spoken out so much that he fears for his own life. And so he leaves Oregon, he returns to New York and he, he publishes a book, um, saying that immigrants are the cause of a lot of this violence and talking about what's happening to Native peoples in Oregon. Hmm. I mean, this gets us maybe kind of into the last the last couple of chapters of your book, which kind of moves move beyond, we'll start, you know, eventually moves beyond the the Overland generation, the survivors of that, or maybe like the, you know, the very next generation after that, you know, with Helen Hunt Jackson's book, A Century of Dishonor, there is this growing awareness that, oh gosh, yeah. like we we have sins to answer for as a nation, yes. right? Yes. Um, and she, and she's very, which I, one of the things I found interesting about her book, because this goes back to your earlier point, is that she's very precise about calling out the federal government um, and not immigrants specifically. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. And also pushes against that use of the vanishing Indian trope. Yes as justification because some maybe said like yeah this is really horrible but you know it's inevitable um and uh i i meant them no malice but this is just the way you know things are going um mm -hmm. so jackson and others were explicitly saying no like decisions were made this is something i found really powerful about claudio sant's recent book unworthy republic as yeah. he lays out like a lot of like the, just like the bureaucracy and the the political decision making about native removal it wasn't just an inevitability people were sitting in rooms making decisions yeah uh and, and people and he, people at the top right like that was that was sorry to interrupt you just i'm really excited about that book too but that to me was also one of the revelations in that book you know it wasn't people just like trying to get a little bit of land so they could have a piece of the american dream american opportunity this was like yeah people at the top yeah uh, well, let's talk kind of move towards the the end of the these histories that you trace and talk about how people have memorialized this. and um, and we already mentioned a little bit about, you know, the survivors um, wanting to be able to locate where their dead were buried, um, you know, within their own lifetime, and then maybe those immediate generations as well wanting to know what like we're on the trail. But, you know, we're now how many years later now? like like almost 200. Uh, well, uh, yeah. yeah, almost 200, right? over 150 years later. Mm -hmm. And there are still, as you said, like cadet, people with cadaver dogs going out there trying to locate these things. Um, so what are some of the like long-term legacies of and, and kind of cultural politics of remembering this um, from that first generation after, you know, up to the present with the, you know, the Oregon Trail Memorial Association, which is still, you know, th these groups are still doing that. Why should we think critically about how we're remembering the dead and the burial, burials and the Overland Trail? Yeah, that's a really good question. Sorry, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so so remembering the dead has right been important since people started traveling. And as I try to show in the book, even before, um, but then, you know, in the later 19th century and then into the 20th century, uh, this these graves become really some of the only things that are left of this major moment, right? You like know, they didn't leave. Think it was a trail. They were moving, right? And so the exactly. structures, things like actual specific locations that where they leave something is often, yeah. I right. mean, maybe a wa maybe a wagon that broke down, but that's going to yeah. deteriorate or be used as scrap or be used as scrap in burials. 
Yes. Um, it's like the burials are the sites that persist. They are. Yeah. Yeah. And um and and some of these burials they've been they've been fenced for a long time. So in some places, I think like Iowa and even other places, um the the land in sort of the grasses inside the fence of the burials, those are like the only remnants of native grasses in many of these places, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, these are the sites like this is it. Right. And like, you know, growing up in in the U.S. West, uh, you know, we we do have. Places to see things and historic sites and things like this, but it's. It's not like going to Boston and walking the Freedom Trail through the middle of the city, right? Historic sites are different in the West. They're often more remote, remote, excuse me. They're harder to get to. um, And the density is just not there. And so these these spread out trail graves and also the idea that the entire landscape of the West could potentially be filled with the dead of the trail because, you know, this is one of the things that early trail memorialists like to say is, you know, um, you know, that's, there's 20,000 dead on this trail, you know, they're all over. Right. And, you know, some of these, some of these, um, trail historians have done really important work counting the dead and saying, you know, it's, it's a much smaller number, you know, um, Richard Reek has estimated, you know, 6,600. He's probably, that's probably right. Um, but this idea that it's huge and this idea that, even though unmarked, they could be out there is really, really important. So that's why people still go to search for them. They're still involved in that active inheritance of pioneer heritage, and they're still going out to mark and claim the landscape um, for, you know, white people and white history. Yes, yeah, so there's like real, it, it provides rhetorical uh, value. Um, like if, the, if there's like burials just everywhere, that's now a lot of land that the United States should be able to lay claim to, right? Yeah. This is our land, our dead, our yeah, our strewn across it. Yeah. Um, I I, I grew up um, in a Latter Day Saint household, and the, the 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 histories and the stories, you know, in Sunday school and stuff about uh, Mormon pioneers and you know the hand carts where they didn't have wags and they were just dragging their stuff across plains that factored very prominently. Mm-hmm. Um. And it became a big, it was a big source for, for identity and for, um, you know, that like our pioneer, you know, ancestors suffered and did X, Y, and Z. And that should mean something to us today for like what kind of people we are and how we, you know, act as, as people. Mm -hmm. Um, As you think about this work today and, you know, public memory and, and whatnot, how do you hope that this retelling might influence how people think about us today and what we are as a society or as individuals? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's such an important question. Um, and I think it goes back to some of the things we started talking about at the beginning of the conversation. You know, just the fact that there is so much public memory and interest in this topic, but not as much scholarly in the last few decades. And what I hope that my book shows is that this burgeoning, growing, urgent, and very necessary focus on spotlighting the diversity of peoples who have shaped the United States. What I hope my book shows is that that diversity and that shaping has always been there, and that it was explicitly there in the ways in which the meaning of the trail was formed as it was happening. That the legacy of these white pioneer dead in the landscape is in fact a legacy that was shaped as well by the native peoples they were trying to displace. And so this, and so I see this, the long, sort of the long context of the story, um, the long scope of the story as not one of of displacement, because one of the things I, I close the book with is the fact that um, Native use of their debt is all about persistence and reclaiming homelands. And I think that by putting that work in this deeper context and showing how that work um, has been going on since the 19th century, that hopefully we can 
start to reframe the trail as sort of one thread, one thread of dispossession that is intertwined with stories of persistence and survivance of Native peoples, and that they've they've inflected this story fr from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, this is something we haven't touched on a, uh, in a lot in our conversation, but you return back to Indigenous peoples throughout the book to talk about how they uh, were resist. So, you know, if the Overland Trail is at in the moment and later being cast as a white story and one of American triumph and one of American perseverance and, and, and suffering that, that, that therefore gives America claim to the land. From day one, there was native resistance to that and a lot of, of cultural and, and you know, public political work to try to reframe that. So, uh, you know, since the, you know, the red power movement and, you know, the last over the last 50 years, uh, America is slowly doing better at kind of grappling with this. And perhaps your book takes what is often a very triumphant white American story and saying, hey, this story actually has a lot to say to these current ongoing, you know, native, non-native relations in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's not a thread that has been woven in much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I do hope that the book contributes to that. And I think, you know, I was, I was never interested in death for death, but I began to see the really important cultural and political work it was doing. And that's how I saw it sitting at the center of this story. Well, um, I want to congratulate you on the book. Um, I do think this is a big intervention. I was joking before you were joking, say, well, we'll see. But no, I, I, th I think you really did succeed in taking what many historians, I think, view as just like a boring old topic that, oh, gosh, Overland Trail and not just revitalizing it, but saying there's actually a lot here that is really profound and important that the rest of us need to think critically about and weave into, you know, the histories that we're, that we're working on. So, uh, you know, all of the congratulations and I hope it gets all the accolades it deserves. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It was so great to chat with you this morning. Yep. This was a pleasure. Well, I hope to um, see you sometime, sometime soon in person, Sarah. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast, or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We're an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understandings about the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream, have an annual funding cycle with award, grant, and fellowship categories that nearly anyone researching or working on the region from any disciplinary approach or towards any final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D -D Center. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Dahl, Anderson, with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, and just about everything else, so you can direct any praise or critique my way. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, Native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. Recently, my book, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, won the Best Historical Nonfiction Book Award from the Western Writers of America. In an anthology I co-edited with P. Jane Hafen, entitled Essays on American Indian and Mormon History, published by the University of Utah Press in 2019, won the Metcalf Best Anthology Book Prize from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Here at the Red Center, I'm also general editor and project manager of a great digital history, uh, public history project named Intermountain Histories. It's a free mobile app and website, uh, intermountainhistories.org, that curates student researched and written micro histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or anything else, head to bwrensink, that's R E N S I N K, dot org or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. 
Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. Cheers.